Hello and welcome everyone to the English Society podcast. Today we are talking about all things reps and I am joined today by various reps from across English. If you'd all like to introduce yourselves one by one. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm a first year English course rep. Hi, my name is Shinexu. <laughs> I'm a second year English student and I'm an EDI rep for English Society. Hi, I'm Lilith. I'm a third year English and philosophy student and I am the English education rep this year. Hi, I'm Brad. I'm the faculty rep for the Faculty of Arts and I study French and Spanish. Lovely. Thank you all. So yeah, today we're just going to talk about various things to do with reps and hopefully give all of you listening a better understanding of the rep system and you know I'm going to be learning as well because I think reps are something they're often forgotten about and really need to be spotlighted which is the main intention of this podcast. So as we go through we're going to talk about various things and I think a good place to begin is the sort of rep system, the education network system itself and I'm wondering if any of you any of you want to talk about the structure of the system and how it all fits together. Yeah, I don't mind starting. So basically the education network in the SU have um, their own academic representation system. So there's sort of course reps at a course level, obviously, and they feed into an education rep. So the system's kind of hierarchical. So um, the course reps feed into the education rep. Education reps feed to the faculty reps, which there are sort of six of. I think we've only got five positions filled at the moment. But um, and they obviously then go to the education officer and the postgraduate officer who work in the SU and just represent the student body on an academic level. Lovely, lovely. Sounds good. So if all of you sort of say what your different rep roles are, so we want to talk about what different reps do generally. And then when you sort of do that, maybe mention why you became reps, would you recommend it and the transferable skills that you gain from it, if that's okay. Um, so I am a course rep. So my role is to gather feedback from the students and feed them back to the education rep. And I chose to do it because I wanted to help um, the students and gain some new skills to do with communication and to try and help get the best possible university experience and I would definitely recommend it. It's a really useful insight into the way the English uh, School of English run and how everything works. How did you become one Laura? Like where did you apply? What was the application process if there was one? Um, so the application process changed this year so that anyone who wished to become a course rep could apply and get in. So we got emails about it at the start of the year and I just filled out a really quick and easy form um, asking who I was and why I wanted to become a rep and that was all there, w all there was to it. Lovely, thank you Laura. Uh, Chinechi? Hi, I'm a third year English student um, and I'm also a EDI rep for the English Society. Um, my main role is to kind of uh, diversify both the English Society and help to diversify the English um, course since it's run, well, since the texts tend to be of white men and not reflective of the varying ethnicities on the course. Um, I first I think I first got into it because of um, like Lucy and sh Lucy Jones and she proposed this EDI role that I was interested in and um, would I recommend it? Sure, like it, at the end of the day like it does something good, it um, is inclusive of people from all different backgrounds, not only ethnicities, um, sexuality, gender, what have you and um, yeah it's, it's, it's a chance to do some real good the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds it, it sounds it. Uh, and again as well, could we just touch on how you applied to become one, what the process was, was it easy? I didn't fill out an application form like um, as mentioned before. Um, I just kind of um, showed my interest in the role and Lucy recommended that I, you know, pursue the role and um, I contacted Joe about the role and he was very facilitating. Um, and that was pretty much it. Lovely, thank you, Janekshi. Um, yeah, Lilith, if you wanna? Yeah, so um, I was originally a course rep last year before I became education rep. So 
Um, in the summer, um, when uh, we were all home during the first lockdown, um, they opened up the elections for education and faculty reps. So um, the system then is like an election process, so you nominate yourself and people vote for you. Um, that used to be the way it was for course reps as well, but um, they've definitely, as Laura mentioned, made it a lot more inclusive, which is nice because I think it's better sort of representation is more representational the more voices you have so that always made quite a lot of sense really um, and yeah I think it's a really really good role to have I mean there's quite a lot of responsibility to it um, but that's a good thing like that's nothing bad but um, I definitely recommend get, getting involved as an education or as a course rep um, or an EDI rep as well because I think it's good to feel like you're giving something back to the uni in a way I mean obviously they're voluntary roles but it's nice to feel like um, you're actually making a change and improving um, the rest of the student body's academic experience while you're here. Lovely. Thank you, Lily. You sort of covered how to become one there as well, so that's all good. Uh, Bradley, if you want to just comment on your role. Yeah, sure. So I'm a, I'm a faculty rep, obviously, for the, the faculty, um, which essentially means more or less that obviously I'm here to make sure everyone within the faculty has as amazing an experience at uni as possible, uh, both from an educational and from an extracurricular standpoint. Um, so I do that essentially from getting my feedback from course reps through Lilith and then feeding them onto the correct people at a faculty level. Um, so these will be things that affect all students in the faculty, not necessarily just the School of English, but obviously they will affect you as well. <laughs> um, and in terms of how I got into this role, it's exactly the same as what Lilith did. I, I think, so I was a course rep in second year and I just remember getting the email and it was actually that that led me to, to say, yeah, you know what, why not? Let's just do it. Um, went for it, uh, got, got, uh, got the role and absolutely loved it because as, as everyone mentioned so far, it's nice to feel like you're making a difference and you are making a difference. It's, uh, it's not just a title when you can put on your CV. Well, that helps. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's lovely. It's great. And I couldn't recommend it enough. I'm pleased. I'm pleased. Yeah, it sounds very good. Um, did we mention how many reps are in English specifically? Yes, yeah, so um, at the moment as it stands we've got um, roughly around 35 course reps in English which is amazing like considering most mm. years you have sort of um, I think about eight or nine so um, that's really really positive positive. Um, and I think there's also about 10 EDI reps as well um, which are considerably new introductions so that's a really good sign um, and we're actually the education network are actually um, advertising for more positions and they're currently recruiting for more reps so if you're interested in applying um, you can do that um, by visiting the education network social media pages and they've been advertised there um, and yeah like you said Joan I suppose Brad like touched on this a bit like it is a lot more than just a title like obviously it's a great thing to be able to put on your CV but it's more than that like the sort of transferable skills you gain from it are so invaluable these days like you know, everybody knows that graduating from university like isn't always enough these days. It's useful to be able to have some sort of experience that you've had while you're at uni, um, because it's it's really helpful to have those sort of skills in terms of leadership and communication, things like that. So um, I definitely consider anyone who's um, I definitely recommend to anyone who's considering to apply. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Sounds good. Um, so. Looking at a specific focus then on the course in education reps, um, yeah, I just want to know a little bit more about the sort of day to day of your role, what meetings you attend, I'm talking about things like the LCF, I think it means Learning Community Forum, um, and yeah, aims and targets for the year, how you make change, all sorts of stuff like that. So yeah, uh, go for it, either one of you two. Yes, so one of the main points of um, the main meetings that course reps attend is um, our learning community forums. So there's one of those in every sort of school or department. Um, and yeah, that's the sort of thing that me and Laura attend. I don't know, Laura, did you want to talk a little bit about? We had ours only yesterday, so it's quite fresh <laughs> in our memory, which was really, really good. We had a good turnout. Um, because of the amount of reps we have at the moment, we have been designating lead reps. So we have three LCFs a year, um, one in each term, and we have lead reps who attend those. So each rep will only attend one LCF, if that makes sense, and it alternates each term. But yeah, we talked about some really important things. We talked about feedback yesterday and the sort of um, issues in the delays with feedback because of the kind of 
um, the amount of ECs that were obviously put in because of the pandemic. Um, and one of the things that we do in the LCFs, obviously these are attended by like lots of key staff in the school as well. Mm -hmm. um, once everything has been said, the ESE team that attend will make, um, will draft up the minutes and they'll make action points from those. So they are published on the LCF Moodle page. So any student can view those. They can see what we've raised, see what we've talked about and see what the action points are moving forward. So um, another place that things go um, to sort of go to a, a higher level, if that makes sense, um, is in English we have teaching committee, which is attended by predominantly members of staff in the school and myself. And they talk about sort of the points that have, raised, have been raised at the LCF or by other members of staff as well. Um, and try and just deliberate on how things are gonna get um, resolved basically and try and come up with a res resolution. Sounds good. So Laura, how do you get feedback from students and how do students indeed give you feedback? Um, so there are two main ways we ask for feedback. So first of all is quite a formal um, survey that we posted every few months. Um, so the one in September had specific points for students to say about how they were feeling within the School of English. Um, we have a year wide survey that any student can um, fill out whenever they've got an issue. And then you can also use the much more informal method of just talking to us. Um, we're on the social media pages this year and hopefully when we're back face to face you should be able to talk to us face to face as well and just informally raise any feedback you've got and we'll note it down and um, feed that back to our education rep who will then create the minutes for the future meetings and learning community forums. Lovely, that sounds really, really useful students there's definitely um, been some challenges as well haven't there i suppose with like i don't know if you guys have found this like brad as well because of the pandemic like not having that face-to-face -face interaction like with peers has definitely been a bit of an obstacle yeah it's an obstacle uh, definitely but it's it's allowed us to capitalize on what we've got online uh, like laura said which i think is a fantastic idea um within the school of english you guys have got got that survey so it's very, instead of having to seek out a course rep amongst a million faces in it in a lecture hall um you, you know it's quite an easy method so it's yeah you're right it, it creates a difficulty but we're working around it i guess and uh, sorry Go and ahead. all feedback is anonymous as well including the surveys so if you've got a point that's a bit more personal or you're worried about sort of being singled out you absolutely won't be it's all anonymous generally if you're thinking it someone else is too so it's great to raise it yeah, definitely. And then I'll just add to that as well. So again, on the LCF Moodle page, there's an, on an anonymous feedback form that's there um, all year round. So anyone can fill that in at any point of the term. Um, and again, those points get raised at the LCF as well. Lovely. That's brilliant. Um, do you want to talk about aims and targets for the year? Um, so a couple of our aims this year have been about um, student voice generally, actually, which is kind of the sort of point of this podcast and just generally improving um, the system of sort of uh, gathering feedback from students, but also raising the profile of reps as well within the school. So um, this was one of my aims as course rep. It's definitely been on sort of English's radar for a while. Um, I took part in the Know Your Rep campaign um, last year, which was just about trying to improve the sort of profile of reps in the school. And we had a student rep newsletter that went out just to try and make people more aware of who their reps were and what they do. Um, but on a more sort of general level, I suppose the pandemic again has interrupted some things because a lot of the focus has been around blended learning and the sort of interruptions that the pandemic has, has caused. Um, but one of the things we have been looking at and is ongoing is the idea of sort of assessment mapping and looking at um, the fairness of sort of um, credit weightings, module weightings. So some um, modules are assessed with one 100% end of term essay whereas others are split into two assessments um, with a midterm that's usually like a smaller percentage. Um, however, there's a sort of disparity as well in terms of those 100% weighted essays. Some of them are 2,500 words, some of them are 3,500 words. And basically we're just trying to track the fairness of that and make sure, you know, the amount of reading, the amount of words, all of that is kind of fair across every module, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. It sounds like you're doing some really good work and have some really good aims for the future as well. 
moving on then to talk about EDI reps and Chimechi. Um Just, yeah, similar sort of questions, really. What your role is and your aims, what meetings and things you attend, uh, your power and making change as well, what you sort of do on a day-to-day, -day, and your aims and targets for the year as well. Sure, thanks Joe. So um, I'm an EDI rep. EDI stands for Equality, Diversion and Inclusion. Um, so my role and the type of aims I have is, like as I said before, to try and diversify the English course, um, diversify the English society. And what that means is um, be inclusive of authors from black and Asian minority backgrounds, um, be inclusive of um, books about um, LGBT identity or other unconventional, I say with um, those asterisks, um, <laughs> unconventional identities, um, because it's really important that we are representative of how diverse um, and all the varying identities that we have on our English course. So the kind of meetings I attend, it's, I think it happens on, uh, I think it happens like every semester or something, we have like a challenge and change group where EDI reps, um, they would meet with teachers and lecturers on uh, at English and we'd kind of discuss what the main and pressing issues were. So I believe that last semester, we were talking about how we should, well, we, we identified the main um, problem um, which was a module in first year that wasn't um, particularly uh, inclusive and um, we felt that that module was quite important because students were coming into English for the first time and they were going to be met with all these books that were from white men and not reflective of you know their own identities and so we were discussing how we could diversify that module um, and how we could be more like um, supportive of other students for the power I guess the power in making change is that because um, it's such a recently developed role and it's very new I can kind of put forward things without having to meet the expectations of what the role should be because there's never been a role like this before so I'm kind of free in deciding what to do and putting forward suggestions. I'm a bit more confident in making um, like perhaps reckless decisions, but in the same sense, because it's such a new role, people still don't understand what it is. And so it's taken a while for the role to fully cement and for people to understand it. So there are both like positives and negatives with this role. And I guess the targets and the aims for this year is just to really like diversify as much as I possibly can before I graduate um, the English course, trying to make sure that there are a lot of books and, and authors that make students feel that they are being represented on the course and that they really enjoy like learning at the end of the day. Yeah, it sounds really, yeah, really sounds good. good. Uh, Shameless worked. plug for the Challenge and Change group as well, which is coming up. Um, that's on the 3rd of March, I think, which is um, it's about demystifying the marking criteria, I think, and how the marking process works within universities. So like external moderators and examiners, that sort of thing. Um, so if anyone wants to attend, you can probably co contact Chineshki or um, Jones, who's EDI sort of coordinator. Uh, yeah, I think your mic cut out briefly there, but Lucy Jones is the EDI coordinator, um, which I think is what Lilith just said, that it cut out a bit. So yeah, get in touch with her or me or Lilith and we can tell you all about it and where to go, etc, etc. I've been to a couple of these challenge and change meetings now and they're really good, really productive and it allows a really good discussion as well between us as students and members of staff as well. So yeah, head along to that uh, if you can. Um, but yeah, moving on to the last rep then in Bradley and if you want to talk about faculty reps then and again, what your role is, what your aims are, what sort of meetings you attend regularly on a day to day basis and sort of what change you can make, have made, etc, etc. Sure, thanks. Um, so my role basically is to to work with Lilith, the education rep and the course reps um, who work with her individually to try and get feedback um, from the ground level uh, with, with course reps um, and things that are going on within the whole faculty and basically sort them out pretty much. Um, you could say a problem solver, although 
uh, up to debate. But we, we try our best. Um, so that can involve all sorts of things because there's two sides of every re representative role, be that a course rep, education rep, faculty rep, or even in any sort of representative role, even in the House of Commons, there's two parts of the role. There's collecting feedback and there's acting on feedback. Um, so I rely on um, the education reps and the course reps to to get that feedback, like I say, with an ear to the ground, because um, I can't get in touch with every single person in the faculty, obviously. Um, and they then feed up that that course, um, what coursework, <laughs> the feedback to me. I've been doing, doing too much uni work, clearly. Um, yeah, and then another side of it as well. So that's obviously representing the students and their, their opinions, but there's also times where where uh, staff want an opinion from students within the faculty. Um, so actually recently, literally 20 minutes before this, we started recording this podcast, I sent out an email to all the reps in the faculty asking about careers being integrated into the curriculum um, because the, the head of the faculty, the PVC of our faculty, Gregory, wants um, is something that he's interested in doing, but obviously he doesn't want to do it without getting any student feedback on it. So I've been asked to rep to to collect that feedback and represent the views of all the students in the faculty. As hard as that is, obviously, because we'll never get that much agreement amongst the whole the whole faculty. Um, but that's somewhat my job. Um, yeah, no pressure, obviously. <laughs> um, and there's also the the meeting. So again, in terms of representing the views of the faculty, one of the first things I actually got to do as a course rep, and I believe Lilith, you might have been at this as well, correct me if I'm wrong, but the COVID response meeting that we were invited to by the cabinet office, which was amazing because we, um, so a lot of students, I say a lot, maybe 20, 30 students from across the, the university were invited to give um, their feedback to a government COVID task force response team which is a lot of words. Um, basically, what they wanted to do was get a student's view of how they, how the government could help students. Um, so obviously, I was representing the, the art students there. Uh, and one of the points that I made was that um, students who have to do compulsory placements within arts, so archaeology students, for example, who have to do uh, excavations to, to graduate, I believe, um, and language students as well, who obviously have a compulsory year abroad, um, they get kind of thrown in the dark with with covid so it was bringing that up to them and, and seeing what they can do to make us exempt from restrictions so that's that's kind of one of the things i had to do one of the more interesting elements of my role um and so i think people a lot of people look at it and think oh well you're probably just replying to emails all day yeah and there are a lot of emails but don't get me wrong <laughs> there's a lot of emails that, that need replying to but there is more to it than that it can be really fun there's some and you do feel like you may most importantly um, I quite regularly meet with um, Chris Woodard, who's the head of ESE, which is Education and Student Experience, within the faculty. Um, and so that's a, essentially me telling him that students feel this way about this, we want this, we don't want this, I can't believe you've done this, um, <laughs> and, and getting his opinion, seeing how he can work around it to keep students happy, basically. Um, and it goes without saying that we obviously can't do that without the incredibly hard work of the course reps and education reps and EDI reps as well. Sorry, I completely forgot you know, to, to, uh, to cover EDI reps, but honestly, underrated, big time, big time underrated because you have such an amazing role and such a, will have such a pivotal experience in university, sorry, a pivotal um, effect on the university experience that will be felt throughout the future. And that comes into my role as well, because obviously we want to leave a bit of a legacy, don't we? Um, at the university. That's so you guys, you guys are doing like, work. Yeah, go without through, sounding too vain, like it does make you feel like you can leave a sort of legacy. Like if there's something that you can implement, and you consider that that's something that the university is going to have from now on, like it does make you feel like you've left a bit of a legacy. It's a nice feeling. Yeah, absolutely. You want to feel like you made a difference, right? Exactly. And Brad, um, so we do, you've got yeah. to do lots of other, I was going to mention as well about you chair academic council, which I forgot to bring up as well, um, oh, and the yeah. faculty forum, of course. So you get to do loads of important yeah. things, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's full of stuff. And that was that was quite literally next on my list, actually. I've, I've written down a long list of the things I, the things I do. Um, yeah, I'm fortunate enough to be to have been elected to chair the academic council which is where all the faculty reps and some education reps um throughout the whole university come to one place to discuss levels at each, um, sorry to discuss issues and matters arising at university level so that's really interesting because that's things like the grace period or the safety net 
or these massive like university-wide issues and that's it's a bit of an ego boost in a way because you do feel like you're actually having like oh my god the words i'm saying really do affect the whole university so that's quite cool um yeah and like i say you feel like you are genuinely making a difference because the university does want to hear your voice um i think it's easy to say the uni doesn't care what we think there's no representation but there is when you realize it's there and obviously that's what this is all about is um promoting student voice um so yeah so i was just going to cover a couple of wins i felt oh, i've had we've had, Go for had it. within the faculty um and the first one honestly is just staying afloat uh and i don't mean that in a we've done nothing apart from just keep going uh, <laughs> i mean in terms of negotiating the horrible obstacle course that is covid um yeah it's been great to to work with the university and students and get both the people students one but at the same time there's a harsh reality of there's only so much the uni can do um mm -hmm. so trying to negotiate that and and manage it is has been really interesting um and i think i think you know we could always do better but you know it's been nice to um it's been nice to see that students are appreciative of the work we're doing and there's also the grace period that we got implemented um so that was a massive win uh it didn't come entirely from us but regardless it was a win uh, so i'm counting it <laughs> so that was great and i think that worked well for everyone yeah and we're, we're doing believe me when i say anyone who's listening to this we are throwing everything at getting the grace period implemented for the second term so uh, i'm pulling my hair out trying to get it to happen so so stick with us um and the third win which which hasn't happened yet but which i wanted to touch on and uh shameless promotion here um of uh, an event called i learn which is helping me put on um in reading week which is essentially a collection of, of of students um sharing kind of study tips and how we've dealt with the online experience and all that kind of thing um essentially it's it's the way i explain it is it's for students by students we're trying to help each other mm -hmm. it's two hours it's two till four on the thursday of reading week um it's on the university website on the reading week agenda thing. If you keep, uh, keep looking at your emails, you'll get one from Trish Lim, presumably uh, at some point about it. And there's already been emails about it. So that will be amazing um, when it goes ahead. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Hopefully, hopefully uh, we'll have some other people there as well uh, to make the most of it. Um, what else did you want me to talk about? Or have I rambled too much? I think you've been very good at rambling and covering a lot of stuff so i didn't even know that. <laughs> yeah. we'll be sure to promote some of those things as well the i learn thing sounds very very oh, cool fantastic. so but yeah it sounds like you're a very busy man um and i don't envy <laughs> that at all um but yeah then if i think that covered everything do you agree yeah definitely like obviously it seems like the things that brad attends is even more exhaustive because it just is like there's so many things at faculty level and then it makes you wonder like what it must be like for sort of Becca and Abdi, who are education and postgraduate yeah. officer, because they must attend a heck of a lot of meetings. Um, but yeah, I think I like Brad sort of touched. Yeah, I think like Brad touched upon as well. I think although maybe the sort of profile of reps has taken a bit of a backseat up until now, I think one of the things about the pandemic, which might be a bit of a silver lining as we move forward, is that people have sort of recognised the role that reps play and how important they are at implementing these kind of the petitions that went round for sort of the safety net or for the grace period. Although they wanted a more kind of immediate response, these are the sort of things that reps have been in place for for a long time. And I've seen a lot of people who have said, you know, obviously a lot of people, there's a lot of discontent going around at the moment with sort of the uni's response to COVID and things. Mm. But a, a lot of people have said, oh, like, you know, because because I've had to look into this because I'm upset for this reason. I'm that who are here to basically voice my concerns. So I hope that going forward, people are going to be a bit more aware of that as things move on. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so yeah, moving on to the last bit of this discussion now and talking about student voice for a bit. So I wonder if you want to cover firstly, what is student voice really? If any of you want to get into that. Yeah, I don't mind touching really? on this. Fire away, this, is, this is your over. time to shine. <laughs> yeah, so student voice on a fundamental level as representatives is about representing the student body and basically making sure your voice is heard. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. I think one of the things that one of the reasons we want to really aim on improving this is because 
I don't know if I'm really allowed to say this, but sort of off the record, um, we've we've failed quite badly on sort of NSS, uh, the National Student Survey, in the past on sort of student voice and representation. Hmm. So that's something that we really, really want to improve. So I think there's a general, I think you'd probably agree with me, Joe, that through our university career, at least up until now, the kind of presence of sort of reps in the education network, sort of academic representation system has taken a kind of back seat for a while. And I think we basically just need to make sure students are more aware of how the process works and just the sort of simple basics, like who their rep is and how they find them and how they can message them, what they can sort of message them about, if that makes sense. For so sure. yeah, there's there's two kind of sides of the, of the coin to it because if the sort of profile of reps isn't, um, have, if, there, if there's not that awareness of reps and what they do, um, then we're not going to be getting the feedback that we need from students. And if we haven't got that sort of connection and communication with students, we can't tell them what we're doing. So it doesn't even look like we're that active in our roles, if that makes yeah. sense. So yeah, it's definitely been a challenge. Um, sort of, you unless you sort of complete one of those, you can't, they're both so reliant on each other. Um, so yeah, I think Gathering student opinion and feedback has been obviously the fundamental part of it, but the sort of rep presence is something that we're really aiming to kind of um, improve, I think. Definitely. I've Could I think you back? Yeah, <laughs> Sorry to interrupt no. you, Joe. Um, go for it. Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, so I think uh, the way I see it, um, which I think helps to sort of clarify how important reps can be, is that if we see it kind of like an MP, Except with your MP, you got no idea who it is because Christ, it's on a national level. So who cares, right? But with with reps and at the university, you are so directly affected by everything that happens that it's uh, and you have such an amazing opportunity to talk to people who are. It could be you, kind of thing, being an MP for your school. If that makes sense. So it's it's so much more of an opportunity to a make a difference and b have your voice heard. Um, that's sort of an advert, I guess, to students to get involved with it. But it just, it's just so much more available the, than I think it is in other representative opportunities, such as politics. Um, so we really need to capitalise on it because your words that you say, you might think, oh, well, they're not going to listen to me. But if you say something to your to me, and then I say it to, uh, who knows, could be Shira West, if we're really lucky. Um, you know those things can get through and it's often it's easy to think that they won't but they can um so yeah it's 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 a lot more powerful than i think people think it is indeed indeed so during covid and stuff then what have been some of the problems with student voice i've certainly encountered this as president and trying to get through to students and stuff and i'm sure you have too so if you just want to evaluate a bit on those problems that you have touched on throughout this really um, yeah, so one of the challenges that we have with getting feedback and responding to feedback is that it's very difficult to know if students have heard when we try and share the feedback that we've raised. So for example, yesterday after the Learning Community Forum, quite informally our lead course rep put on a social media channel everything that he'd heard and just wanted to send back the feedback to the students and close that feedback loop. But because it's on a social media channel, it very quickly gets swallowed by everything else that people are chatting about. And even if we did a more formal option like an email, again, students get maybe five, 10, 20 emails a day. They're not gonna spend the time to read those emails and that means they don't often notice when their feedback has been heard and responded to. That's a really good point, actually. That's something that we have been raising a lot as well because we want to improve this communication. And every time we mention it to sort of staff in the school, they're saying, look, we already have X amount of methods of communication and we already know that those aren't necessarily the best modes of communication to actually get our message across. So we're trying to be sort of innovative with our ideas and try and make sure that we can get it out in the best way possible. But as Laura said, sort of social media isn't always the best way to do it because not everyone's on social media or if they are, are on social media, they're not on it to know what reps are doing. Basically, they're on it on a break from their reading or something, you know. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And we've had I've had lots of discussions with the likes of Becky Cameron, who I think moved on now. She's 
uh, shame. She has, yeah. She has She's in disability now, but... Indeed, but just sort of in terms of how people get bombarded with emails, then there's sort of these Moodle posts you get that I've, I don't think I've ever read one in my life. Um, and then we've tried things on Facebook, tried things on Instagram. It's like this podcast as well, we're trying to use this as a new outlet as well. It's just very, very hard at the moment to target things when students are spending all day, every day staring at a screen at the moment. So I think they're, you know, they're not having the time to dwell on things as Liv says in terms of reps and things. So. Mm, exactly and I think as well although it's hard to imagine what it was even like before Covid these days <laughs> I think there was a much stronger sort of sense of community when we were yeah. on campus and things I mean I know at least with English and our side of the Trent building we had sort of the English common room and we used to have a feedback box in there actually for sort of um, anonymous comments that people wanted to make about English and the course more generally and their modules so I think it's that lack of contact I think even you know, not being able to have contact with your peers, just to, like like Laura sort of touched upon, just to inf have that informal method of communication. You know, when your friends are moaning about, oh, how bad that lecture was, or, <laughs> oh, how much, you know, how stressful this assessment is. Because we're not necessarily having those in-person conversations, there's those little sort of, yeah, informal methods of communication that aren't being had. Um, yeah, I think another thing with the English department more generally, I don't know about if... Brad knows anything about this in other departments but we've got no compulsory modules except from in first year and obviously those are a great place to make announcements like if you have compulsory lectures and the majority of your you know your course are there um, you can stand there and say look I'm going to just steal the limelight for three minutes before the lecture and say oh this is happening or this was raised in the LCF but the school are responding it, to it with this whatever um, because we can't do that in English because, you know, it's so diverse as well with the different departments with English, within English itself. It's really, really hard to, to reach out to everybody. Um, yeah, I, you're right. That must, that must suck. I think, yeah, you, you make a valid point. If there's no compulsory modules, of course, you can't get to everyone. Um, but I know something, it, it won't solve the problem by any means, but I know that what some course reps have done and lecturers have been really good about this normally, um, and if you ask at the end of a lecture, uh, if it is compulsory lecture or even not compulsory lecture, if you just email all the lecturers within the department to say, look, would you mind putting my details as a course rep at the end of your lecture slides? Just have it up there at the end when you're like, because you know you have those kind of five minutes at the end, any questions kind of thing. Yeah. If it's there on the screen, it's kind of they're passively looking at it. Um, so that's often helped. That I did remember doing that in the second year, and that was really helpful when I was a course rep. Um, so yeah, you're right. It doesn't solve the problem. Um, I'm afraid, but it's, it's a step in the right direction of improving student voice, I guess. Yeah. That is a really good idea actually. Yeah. Cause especially these days as well, because lectures are all, you know, everyone's just looking at the slides and going off the slides as <laughs> yeah. well. I think, um, yeah, that's a good point to make. I'm sure Laura, that will be helping you as we move forward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The only, the only thing I really wanted to briefly touch on there was the, Right at the start of this academic year, we had a sort of English society introductory meeting and the overwhelming like number of students there were first years. So it had been advertised on like the first year timetables in first year sort of personal tutor meetings in their lectures and stuff that it was going to be this meeting. And we got like 150, 200 people in that, which is an immense amount of participation for the English Society because we really often don't get anywhere near that. So it just sort of <laughs> went to, yeah, went to reflect Lilith's point there that, yeah, the sort of first year compulsory modules do have their perk. So it's an interesting and hard thing to balance, I think, but something to look at going forward for sure. But yeah, group <laughs> chats, group chats on um, Messenger, because that's where everybody goes to when they're like stressed and they have a problem, don't they? Um, yeah. Go to the course yeah. chat and you can pick up loads of stuff on there. True, well, I've managed to infiltrate the first year group chat, so that was quite useful. In there. How have you managed that? <laughs> uh, I really can't remember how I did that, but it's actually worked quite well. And they, Well, I mean, quite well, as in they always come to me when I have a problem. Um, but it's <laughs> helped to get us out there, and particularly when everyone was kicking off about a month and a bit ago about all the grace period stuff, it's a really good way to keep them informed, I think. And obviously I'm in the third year one. The second year one I'm yet to infiltrate and I think it's a bit late now. Last thing then that we're going to touch on is the feedback loop then, if you could. Feedback loop is one of those terms that loads of tutors use and I'm not a fan of necessarily because it sounds really cryptic. You think, what on earth does it even mean? 
But the basic concept is you as students give us your complaints. We take them to our relevant meetings and they go to staff. And then the sort of cycle of it, I suppose, is how it gets back to students. And this is often where we kind of meet kind of hurdles and obstacles. So um, although there are certain hurdles, I guess, with actually getting adequate feedback from students, I think the main issue is getting the feedback back to students about where their issues have been taken. So one of the things um, I'll probably just flag up now is that um, all of the minutes from all of our meetings, uh, well, the LCF meetings at least, are available on the LCF Moodle page. So you can see exactly what's been raised and how that's being dealt with. And there's also a sort of what matters to you. Um, we have those events throughout the year, um, but they're on the LCF Moodle page as well. So they've got a bit that says, um, you said we did and the sort of wins that we've had. So yeah, the general idea is just, we need to be making, um, I suppose to actually employ this sort of phrase um, and yeah, communicating back to reps so that they actually know that their voices are being heard, I suppose. I'd just second it really, that's all right. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'd just say, look, it's, it's Sorry. So yeah, it's um yeah, I think it's really important as students you because that's the thing, you want to see evidence of the actions. If you keep giving feedback and nothing's being done, you kind of lose hope after a while, right? But when you can see the evidence that what you're saying is making a difference uh, as a student, uh it's really fun and it reinforces that uh faith in the education network. So finally then, um I just wanna quickly discuss the LCF Moodle page, if any of you want to chime in on that. Yeah, so the LCF Moodle page, um, every student has access to, and that's basically just where you'll find information on who your rep is for your year group and your course, and how to contact them, have their email address as well. Um, I think we used to have faces on there. I'm not sure if we have faces on there, but it's not so relevant in these COVID days. Um, and yeah, there's the anonymous feedback form that we mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, and if you've got anything to say, you can put any of your concerns in there. We also, this is another thing, we also love it if you actually do have anything positive to say. I think as you can imagine, it's usually people who are very unhappy, which obviously makes a lot more sense, but it's nice to have something positive in there, just to know that we're on the right track, at least with some um, elements within English, if you know what I mean. I think, um, Basically, I just stress that any reps can access the minutes from previous LCFs because I don't think that's something that, that you're necessarily aware of. I mean, again, this is the thing. I don't think you get told that you can access um, the minutes from the LCF. So, yeah, I definitely recommend having the read through those. The one from the LCF, which took place yesterday, will be on there within the next sort of week or so. So, um, yeah, and sort of action points that have been made and taken to teaching committee will be on there as well. Um, and this is actually quite interesting. I don't know if you knew this, Joe, but you, you can access um, the external examiner reports. So anyone can look at those. So you can just look at what external examiners have said about our tutors marking, which is really, this is really interesting. <laughs> quite humorous. <laughs> it's definitely not kind of like light reading that you just like to do for the fun of it, but um, <laughs> don't get me wrong. There's some juicy stuff in there. I might have to check that out. Um, Bradley, do you want to have a go if there's anything to add? Any other places where you can find information? I don't know if there's... don't know. Well, this is the trouble. Um, <laughs> this is the trouble in that with the, the meetings that I... So the Academic Council, for example, and the Faculty Forum, I don't think the minutes are open to the... I don't want to say general public, but to, to, to students that aren't within the education network. Um, that being said, that's probably something I should have looked into before this podcast. <laughs> so, um, but I think uh, anything that would have been mentioned there that is of importance, uh, you'll see sort of in a, you'll see it come into action at, across the faculty, basically. If there's a massive issue, say, for example, uh, and it's sort of a faculty issue, but the grace period, um, something along that kind of level, if it's, if it's that important that you want to look for it in the faculty forum meetings uh, and minutes, then it will be implemented and you will be affected by it anyway. I think that's kind of really, really vague way of getting around the question, but essentially, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> 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 
Uh, Lauren, Shinexi, anything to add, or have we sort of covered all of the answers? Maybe on like whether challenge and change. Yeah, I don't know whether there's any updates, updates from challenge and change. Any updates from Challenge and change, not, I, I, nothing off the top of my head, but there are some small like tidbits that some of the EDI reps want to do. I think um, we wants to get a reading group where we kind of discuss and read books by BAME authors up and, up and coming um, in a couple of weeks. And I think there was another EDI rep who wanted to have a, um, I think like a conference equivalent with some BAME authors and poets just to kind of diversify the whole English society and the English curriculum as a whole. But other than that, um, I can't really say much about Challenge and Change Group. Yeah, um, yeah, I've heard of all these things that Chinexi has spoken about. And yeah, they seem really exciting things that we're supporting as the English society, but things that they're really taking the lead on. And they're really good. And yeah, look out for those, we'll promote them and EDI reps will promote them. But yeah, they seem like really good, exciting opportunities. Um, I would just emphasise one more as well in terms of, I mean, I know we mentioned earlier about like the amount of emails that we get through and like our university <laughs> emails, but one thing that we do release each month, which you probably noticed, I don't know if you read it through in its entirety, I wouldn't expect you to, but is the English newsletter, um, because basically any updates on anything, whether it's academic or even from like the challenge and change groups or things about um, speakers that we've had in English that's always in the newsletter so it's definitely worth reading I mean it can be lengthy but it's only once a month and some of the stuff in there is actually really really important yeah indeed always give those a read if Second. you can mm. yeah Bradley seconds that <laughs> but yeah we're drawing that to a close here then um, I'm sure if you have any questions about any of all this our inboxes are open uh, we do get a lot of emails, but we are sort of responsive-ish. Um, um, but yeah, if you contact a few of us, one of us will get back to you. Um, but yeah, we hope this has been useful. I really thank all of the reps for being here and coming along and chatting to me. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening.